It'll be far easier that way, I think. So I'll leave you with the capable hands of Adrian Hughes. Yeah, 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 Just before, just before, it is something that I do need to tell you. In, on, in August, uh, we know we're doing the talk in the community centre, and it was, it's been listed for the 17th of August. And unfortunately, that through circumstances beyond our control, we can't have that weekend, we can't have that chapel, so it goes to the 24th of August. Uh, okay, it's, it's unfortunate, but we can't have that for want of whatever reason. But um, there's another guy, there's a guy there called Guy Thomas, he's talking about yeah. it. So I don't know if you know him, but get to know him anyway. You know, just need to know that. Okay. Are there some lights we can dig? Yeah. <coughs> Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for the warm welcome. Can you all hear me at the back? Yeah. That's always a good sign. Okay, so um, thank you for the introduction. Um, as you uh, alluded to, I've been collecting Second World War memorabilia since I was eight years old. There was a, um, an incendiary bomb landed on my grandparents' drive during the war. They lived on the Wirral opposite Liverpool there. And in the May Blitz of 1941, the Germans dropped hundreds of thousands of tons of high explosive and incendiary bombs on the area. And this landed on their drive, and they put it out with a bucket of sand, as the government instructed you to do so. But when I was growing up, they used to use it as a doorstop. It used to prop open the living room door, this, this little incendiary bomb. So I'd pick it up and sort of say, Granny, what's this? And she'd say, oh, that's a German bomb. So if I blah, I'd say, oh, yeah, that's just a German bomb. So I was fascinated, really, since then. So back in 1999, I bought um, an old fire station in Clandidno and uh, in 2000 opened the Home Front Museum. Um, and I should have bought some leaflets and dished them out, but of course I forgot, didn't I? But, um, no, I didn't. No. You didn't know I was there? No, no, no. Oh, baby. Thank you very much. But tonight I'm going to actually talk about Clandidno during the Second World War. And it played really quite an important role because it played host to thousands and thousands of evacuees. Not child evacuees, but adult evacuees. And I want to talk about uh, some of those as we go on. And probably the the biggest group of evacuees that came were from the Inland Revenue from London. And for a number of years, um, the government had planned that if war came, if there was a national emergency, they would move certain departments out of central London and uh, disperse them into the uh, provinces for, for, for safety. And uh, I think you probably know that Rill had the Ministry of Works, Colwyn Bay had the Ministry of Food and Clandidno had the inland revenue. You still had to pay your taxes. And of course, in wartime, paying those taxes and paying for the war was even more vital. So hotels started to be requisitioned. Basically, on the 3rd of September, the day war was declared, 1939. But the civil servants themselves didn't come up to Clandidno until May 1940, after the fall of, um, of the Low Countries and France and the evacuation from Dunkirk. There was obviously a mass panic, are we going to be next? We'll move the departments uh, away out of London. And the Imperial Hotel was one of the first to be requisitioned. You know, it's the headquarters of the Inland Revenue while they were in Clandidno. And uh, the top civil servants all had their offices in there, including Sir William Diggins, if that's how you say his name, and he was the Chief Inspector of Taxes. Now, the civil servants took over all the seafront hotels for office accommodation, and they had to bring everything with them. And that, I mean, today, obviously, everything's digitised, but in those days, you know, it was a massive logistical operation. Special trains were chartered. The <coughs> civil servants, plus all those millions of files, the paperwork, was all put on the train and brought up to Clandidno. 
And so, as I say, the civil servants' offices were all in the seafront hotels, but the civil servants themselves, of which there were about 5,000, plus their families, they had to find accommodation in the small uh, guest houses, the boarding houses, and in private houses in Clandino, in De Ganway, in Clandino Junction, away from Clandino. Now, the civil servant responsible for finding all this bed space was this man. Does anyone know who he is? Does that help? <laughs> Indeed, Jim Callahan was the Assistant General Secretary of the Inland Revenue Staff Federation. Bit of a tongue twister, so I always have to read it. And he was one of the first to be posted to Clandino um, in his role there as billeting and welfare officer for all these civil servants. And he became very familiar to the boarding house uh, owners of Clandino as he went round trying to settle thousands of civil servants in their new surroundings. Now, to many local people in Clandino, and Corwin Bay, and real I suspect, uh, the civil servants were simply known as guinea pigs because they paid one guinea for their board and lodgings. So they were known as guinea pigs. Just going back to Jim Callahan, he, actually, he uh, lived in the top floor flat up here at uh, 7 Mostyn Crescent, which is just around the corner from the Imperial Hotel. Um, he left Clandino in 1942. He joined the Royal Navy. And, uh, of course, we know him as Prime Minister between 76 and 79. Mm -hmm. Well, you might, I wasn't born, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is the Craigside Hydro, um, another hotel in Clandino that sadly is gone and, um, and a state of bungalows is on it. So if you drive into Clandino from Colwyn Bay, you come up past the Welcome to Clandino sign. It was on the left-hand side as you swept down into the town. Um, and it was requisitioned in September 1939, and it was used by the Special Commissioners of Income Tax. Now, before the war, the hotel was managed by a chap called Joseph Kendall Jackson. And when the hotel was taken by the um, Inland Revenue, he actually became Clandidno's food officer. Um, the Civil Service um, and the Inland Revenue stayed in this hotel until 1948, and a family member told me, that it cost over £25,000 for the family to repair the Craigside Hydro after the ministry had left because of the damage caused. Apparently they quite liked sitting on their seats and kicking holes in walls. Oh, and, oh. and while the, well, the Kendall Jackson sort of said, well, look, can't we have a bit of money compensation? They were basically told, you know, there's been a war, you've all got to sort of accept, and, and so it was very difficult for them to get, uh, to get funding. On the other side of the, this is the Craigside Hydro here, and on the other side of the road, there used to be tennis courts that belonged to the Craigside Hydro. And there were something like 400 uh, civil servants had their offices in here. But it must have been a really nasty place to, uh, to have an office, especially in the winter. There was no heating whatsoever, it was cold and drafty. Um, apparently, uh, some people had to put buckets on their desks to catch the drips from the roof, and, um, and sparrows and other pigeons and other uh, avian life nested in the roof. So it was quite a, quite a challenging place to be. Now, there's a couple of tragedies associated with the Craigside Hydro in the Second World War. In around 1943, an airspeed Oxford flew into the side of the Little Orme. Um, apparently the pilot was showboating to his fiancée, who was one of the civil servants who was working at the Craigside Hydro. And his plane obviously broke up um, and bits uh, came up onto the beach. Um, he died, of course. Um, this is an aerial shot of the Craigside Hydro, just there. Again, you can see Colwyn Road coming in, and this is the tennis course. And this is the pipeline. Hydro, Craigside Hydro, used to have big hydrotherapy pools. And the pumping station, you can just make out there. And in 1946, uh, two civil servants were killed, and a third was injured. Um, they were only sort of 15, 16 year olds and they used to go down to the pumping stations at lunchtime, probably for smoke or whatever, nefarious activities, I'm not sure. But the roof collapsed on them, killing two of them and injuring a third, so that was another tragedy associated with it. It's a lovely picture, and this is what they call connecting. These are all clerical assistants that have come up from London to Clandard now. And every morning they had to connect. By connecting, they had to connect the post with the correct office. And these girls would be running 
wandering fast up and down uh, the promenade, in and out of the hotels, looking for the correct offices for the post. This is the Ormscliff, which is now the Clandidno Bay. It's had many names, and it's, um, it's about halfway along the promenade um, on the Little Orm side of Venue Cymru. And it was this and the Crescent Hotel, which is, was in the same block, which is now Flats, and they were uh, converted into recreation centres for the inland revenue staff. Um, and they had their own games rooms and all sorts of, sort of facilities like that. And they also produced their own um, periodical, uh, sort of monthly magazine called the Ormsford Gazette. And uh, they formed over 50 clubs um, for their staff, including chess, cricket, badminton, football, basically you name it, they did it. Uh, and musical and theatrical societies, and they regularly put on shows and concerts, as you can see from this pair of, uh, of programmes here. They were often held in the Ormscliff Ballroom, but also in the Pier Pavilion as well, um, which is something else that's gone, because it burned down in 1993 and never been replaced. The staff of the Inland Revenue, uh, like everyone else, were encouraged to grow their own vegetables um, in the Dig for Victory campaign, and uh, you might recognise the same girls that were in that connecting photo um, are here, and here they are, forlornly waiting for their crops to grow. <laughs> this uh, now is known as the County Hotel, but back then it was the Cradon Boarding House, and it uh, housed the rather grandly named Inspectorate of Foreign and Colonial Dividends Department of the Inland Revenue. Bit of a mouthful. And they left in 1948, and the property was bought by Fred and Sheila Davis, and they renamed it the County. Now, you might recognise uh, Fred. He was um, World Snooker Champion in 1948, 49 and 51. And apparently after each victory, he would come uh, back into Clandano by train with his trophy, and a huge crowd would, uh, would greet them. Um, he's probably, it's probably his older brother, Joe, who's, who's even more famous, I think, than, um, than Fred. Apparently, he also um, had a second house in Craigadon, which was called Billiards. Snookers. <laughs> Snookers, not Billiards. Snookers, was it? Snookers, yeah. It was close. <laughs> in the background here, we can see the Grand Theatre, which is now the Broadway Boulevard, which I'm sure you all go night clubbing at on a Friday and Saturday night. Um, and another group of evacuees arrived in Cladden and joined the war, and that was the Variety Department of the BBC. And originally they'd been evacuated to Bristol from London, but when Bristol started getting bombed, BBC decided to move them elsewhere, and they came up north to Wales. Um, and the County Theatre in Bangor was used widely, as was the Grand Theatre, you can see in the background there. The BBC Theatre organ was moved into the, uh, into the Grand Theatre, and played for hour after hour by this man, Sandy McPherson, Canadian yeah. born. And this sort of um, helped with morale, playing the music, playing all the organ music, music while you work, this sort of thing. And it just filled hours and hours of, of wireless airtime. Other radio shows that were broadcast from the Grand Theatre included Itmar, Is That Man Again, Tommy Handley, Ted Kavanagh, um, and also the very popular Happy Drone. Talking of Tommy Handley, he... Um, he was actually billeted in a property at Tinnagongal near Bentleck on Anglesey, and he, was, uh, he had to join the Home Guard there, and they all spoke Welsh, and he clearly didn't, and he just thought it was amusing because, you know, they would uh, be uh, ordered to do drill, and he had no idea because the instructions were in Welsh, and, you know, the character he was, he just thought it was hilarious. And he used to say Tinnagongal because he was obviously sort of this wordsmith. And another character in Itmar was uh, Sam Vecken. And that's because some of the uh, BBC staff uh, were billeted in Clanberbecken. And again, it was sort of just playing on these words. In 1944, the BBC broadcast Clanberbecken Half Hour, again from the Grand Theatre. And it was within the Forces programme. And it was for uh, local people were invited to, uh, to go along and, uh, and make contact um, with their relatives in the Forces. This chap here is called Bill Sargent. And he's very well known in Clandino, Sergeant's Radio, some of you may remember it from, uh, from years gone by. I think it's a name now that's disappeared from, uh, from Clandino, but I certainly remember it. Um, and it was around for many years on Maddox Street. 
And as well as a dealer in uh, wireless sets, he also um, dealt with uh, public broadcasting and, and PA systems. And so when the BBC arrived, um, they <coughs> called on Bill to help them because a lot of their staff had been called up um, and they didn't bring as much equipment as they needed. So they sort of said to Bill, can you help us? And he uh, willingly said he would. Uh, and he was very well rewarded for it by all accounts from what I can gather from his family. Um, but as well as his payment, uh, he was also given 50 tickets to most of the shows at the Grand Theatre. And all of a sudden he became Clandernose's most popular man. As, uh, as the townsfolk sort of said to him, oh, have you got tickets for Vera Lynn or, or uh, George Formby or, or Itmar or whatever. But sadly, Bill's war was to end with deep sadness, as you can see in this photo here, uh, because his eldest son, uh, Donnie, was captured by the Japanese and died as a prisoner of war just, just weeks before um, the Japanese surrender in August 1945. In 1940, the government decided that the threat of a German invasion increased enemy bombing that the uh, Royal Artillery uh, Coast Artillery School should move from Shubriness in Essex. Um, and scouts were sent around uh, the country to look for a suitable place for this <coughs> artillery school, and various sites along the west coast were, um, were looked at. But in the end, they decided on an area on the Great Orm, at what we now know as Millionaire's Row, um, at the end of Cliss Helig Drive. Um, and the land was duly requisitioned, um, Moston Estates, the main landowner in Clandidno, um, had plenty to say, obviously, including how much rent they wanted for it, um, and were told not to be so greedy. And one reason was that the site was chosen was because of the anchorage, uh, quite shallow, and it was just a perfect site for them. Um, they, they were apparently good conditions for radio direction finding and searchlight training, which were two aspects that they didn't necessarily have in Shubriness but wanted to expand when they came <coughs> to Clandidno. And the story goes that Royal Engineers um, plotted out the site for the Coast Artillery School with balloons that they brought from Woolworths on Moston Street. Well, the truth in that I'm not sure, but it, it's a good story, and it's, it's in all the, uh, the leaflets that you can get about the Artillery School. Large ammunition magazines were built, and these were then covered in earth. Um, you can see the work going on here. And in this aerial shot, you can see the magazines there. And just to put it into perspective, this is Marine Drive, the toll road, if you like, as it, as it winds back down. And you can see the sort of extent of some of the workings. This is a picture of some of the, uh, the guys. They, they weren't Royal Engineers who were doing the digging. It was, uh, was labourers, local labourers. Um, any of you remember Frank Tilsley, the builders from yes. Clandernick? A lot of his staff were, uh, were involved with this. And this is them excavating the Hornby Battery Observation Post in 1941. Uh, named Hornby after a brig that sank just off the coast there in um, uh, uh, mid-19th century. Um, and that's how it got its name, Hornby. Not after the <laughs> And this is a great image. You can see that some of the buildings are being disguised as little chapels and houses mm -hmm. so that from the air it would look like a village has just suddenly miraculously appeared on the side of the Great Orb. And you can see some of the, uh, the naval guns. And again, you can just make out Marine Drive in the background there with the wall. And these are some of the searchlight emplacements. Uh, there were six in total. Uh, in fact, all six are still there. These three are, um, are in the better condition. The three that are further around the corner, around here, you can just make Puffin Island out in the background there, um, are slowly falling into the sea, unfortunately, uh, because of erosion. I love this photo. You can again make out the uh, marine drive in the background. The, uh, these are Royal Artillerymen. Quite what they're practicing hoisting or doing, I've absolutely no idea, but um, it's a lovely photo that, uh, that came my way. And this uh, photo was taken post war when it was a veritable playground for the local kids. Um, and this is one of the uh, observation posts. Um, sadly, uh, they've all pretty much gone now. 
probably a similar state really to the, um, the Craigside Hydro Pumping Station with the concrete and just falling down mm -hmm. and risk to the public. They were, they were pulled down mostly in the 1950s uh, by Moston Estates. There's some of the, some of the big guns pointing out uh, into the sea. They used to have um, a ship called the SS Gambira that used to tow the targets. Well, I say they had the ship SS Gambira, they managed to hit the ship rather than the target, <laughs> and the SS Gambira is now lying at the, uh, in the shallows there. Um, they also had aerial targets, um, remote control uh, tiger moths, um, queen bees they were called, and they used to take off from T. Croix on Anglesey, towing aerial targets, and they used to come over and uh, they'd fire at those. As far as I know, they didn't manage to hit um, one of the, the queen bees. Built in Broughton. Built in Broughton. <laughs> Fine work. <Yeah. laughs> I worked on one of them. Oh. Here we have more building, six inch gun store, a big pile of bricks, and you can see some of the uh, some of the radar and aerial paraphernalia on top. This is them loading the guns. You can see they've got white stripes on their forage caps, sort of indicating that they're, uh, they're cadets. I presume this guy is in charge. He seems to be doing very little. <laughs> Gas mask in bag, supervising. <laughs> now, there was no accommodation um, on the site. So bear in mind that Clandon No already had 5,000 civil servants from London and their families, and all of a sudden you now had a school of... of, of um, training soldiers, and so accommodation had to be found for them as well, so again, what hotels were left were requisitioned for them, and this photo was taken outside the Gogolf Abbey Hotel, the Alice Hotel, Penmorva, again long gone, um, now a derelict building site, apparently, I think it's Beach Homes or Ann Willer have put in yet another planning application to do something with it, and this photo was, uh, was taken um, in the grounds there, Gogolf Abbey Hotel was uh, the senior officer's mess. And there's another, you can just make out the orm in the background, another group photo. Got quite a few of these, and uh, I think they still do it today in the military, don't they? They, they take photos at the beginning of the course, mm -hmm. they write all the names, and then they put big black crosses yeah, through it when you happens. fail the course. <laughs> so I'm not sure whether they did that back then. And whether you could fail a, a, a course in a, the School of Coast Artillery, I've no idea. It, it was hardly SAS training, but um, there you go. Um, in 1945, the uh, Clandon Urban District Council were very keen to keep the School of Coast Artillery there because it was, it was some employment, um, but the uh, Royal Artillery decided they didn't want to stay and they moved to the um, Citadel in Plymouth and, and that was the end of that, so, um, so they left then. This is the um, an aerial shot of the Great Orme Hotel, the summit complex, the Randolph Turpin, um, yeah, yes, yeah. <laughs> that some of you may remember. Um, and this was taken over by the RAF uh, during the uh, war as part of their chain home uh, radar uh, system. And also some of the golf, uh, because it was a golf course, I should have maybe pointed out, that it was built as a hotel for the golf course. The golf course was built around 1900. And in fact, the Second World War saw the end of the golf course. It, it never returned to being a golf course. It is now as well. It's now a car park and National Trust have got it and, and the Shepherd uh, have farmed it. But some of the golf course was turned over for uh, potato production, again for the Dick for Victory campaign. And uh, I was talking to a chap who was um, at John Bright School and he helped bring in the harvest. Um, they didn't get paid, the school kids, but they got a bit of time off school, so they were quite pleased with themselves. Um, and that's a very poor photo, it's about the only one I've got, you can see uh, as it's captioned RF radar station. And then this one is of interest me, you can see the old Nissan hut um, in front of it, and that was there for, for many years uh, after the war, um, which was quite handy actually, because uh, they used to store a miniature railway a miniature railway was built around it, and uh, that's where they stored the, uh, the locomotives. So, was, so they made use of it. They always make use of military stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was staying on the Great Orm. Um, even today, there's remnants of the war all over the place. You can find all these bits of concrete. Um, 
This one here is up near the summit complex and must be something to do with the, the radar station. And these three are, if any of you have driven round the Marine Drive, there's a cafe called the Rest and Be Thankful. And then yeah. just beyond it, there's a concrete road. The locals call it the tank tracks because it's, it's uh, corrugated and mm -hmm. as you go up it. Uh, technically, it's actually called the Western Car Park. And this base is the car park, but that was actually the, um, the foundations of a building during the Second World War that the locals called Hatter's Castle. Okay, now there was um, a film out at the time, out at the time by um, A.J. Cronin called Hatter's Castle. I've never read the book, but apparently it's all about a, a mysterious building on top of a hill, and the locals decided that this is what this building uh, on the Great Orm um, looked like to them. Very cultured in Clandard now, aren't they? Knowing all about A.J. Cronin, I have to say. Um, now, it was actually a radar college, and you could just make it out here. I mean, it's a beast of a thing. 50, arranged uh, over uh, two stories, 50 rooms, huge dish on the roof. Um, now, quite what went on there, it, it was for training, but in all, I've been at the museum now 20 years, and I've spoken to so many people who were in Clandino during the war, whether they were children of civil servants or, or school coast artillery or whatever. I've never come across anyone who had anything to do with this place on top of the Orm, it's, um, it's still a bit of a mystery. So this was, uh, as I say, this radar college, A-D-R-D-E is its technical uh, <coughs> term, and there's another one down here, C-A-E, don't you love a military acronym? <laughs> uh, Coastal Anti-Aircraft Experimental Establishment. And what they did at these places, who knows, but um, you can make out the little Orm in the background here. Yeah. And it says, this is Marine Drive, and this is the concrete road that I mentioned aforementioned. It's a big old building, big old building indeed. And there was another little radar station above the St. Edno Cemetery. And today if you go on there, because I walk up uh, most days with the dog, and um, it's where the picnic benches are now. Um, and again, you can find no one who remembers it. And I, I talked to people who were children during the war, who went to visit visit relatives' graves in the cemetery, and yet they don't ever remember seeing yeah. this on there, which I found quite odd, but there's the evidence. It was there. It was there. So moving on back into the town itself, uh, we've got the Evans's Hotel, we've got the Risborough Hotel, and we've got the White Heather Hotel. Now these were earmarked for use by MI5. Um, to hide some of Britain's top double agents. Had the Germans come over to the UK, um, it was decided that the double cross, the, the 20 committee, or all that palaver, they were going to move them out of London and they were going to bring some of them to North Wales. I think they had 39 double agents. And um, so as well as these, um, we had the Eagles Hotel in Clan Roost was earmarked, uh, Swallow Falls Hotel, uh, sort of down in Bettus, um, one in Colwyn uh, Rose, next door to the Mount Stewart, um, Montful, like that. Um, and they were all earmarked for use um, for all these double agents. Well, of course, they weren't ever used. So um, I suspect what happened after um, sort of 1941-42, when when Germany invaded uh, Russia and the threat of invasion really did diminish, that these hotels were probably the lucky ones because they could actually take holiday makers back in because yeah. people did want to go on holiday. Um, so they were probably given back. This is Kulak Road, which is um, uh, the Hoover Gardens, the tea gardens, if you walk up towards Invalid's Wharf there. And um, this property was used by the Women's Land Army. Um, during the Second World War as a holiday and rest home. Now, there are only two holiday and rest homes for the WLA, Women's Land Army, in Britain in the Second World War. The one in Clandino and a second one in Torquay. Um, and it opened in April 1944, so it's coming to the end of the war. Um, and the property itself was funded by an American organisation called the British War Relief Society of the USA, and they funded it. There's a lovely photo of some of the girls outside the property. Um, you can see them all in their uniform. Um, there's a girl, that girl there, Barbara Forrester, her mm -hmm. father, um, well-known sculptor in Clandino who did the white rabbit uh, statue at West Shore that oh, yeah. generations of school kids have snapped bits off and they keep having to move it. Um, 
So the property on Kulak Road could accommodate 14 land girls at a time. There's a few more than 14 here, it has to be said. Um, and apparently it had all mod cons, including a wireless and a piano. Oh. The first warden was the lady pictured in the centre, uh, May Jones. And um, she came up from London. Um, during the uh, London Blitz of uh, 1940 41, she came up uh, looking for accommodation to get out of London and she, uh, she came and stayed a couple of years in Clandestine. And then, when this uh, rest home opened, she volunteered to be uh, the first caretaker. And in the first year alone, 600 land girls came to Clandestine for complete RR. &R. Mm -hmm. um, and May Jones stayed until um, March 1947, and she was replaced by a Miss Stamper. What a great name. <laughs> Caretaker, Miss Stamper. Um, and she, she arrived in March 1947, but the home closed in September 47. So, um, and by then, 1,058 girls had spent uh, uh, an enjoyable week or two in the Queen of uh, Welsh Resorts. <coughs> And here's some of them marching down Mostyn Street, um, Forte's Cafe is still there, oh, Harrington yes. Hotel is probably a shoe yes. shop, <laughs> like yes. every other in London name. Yeah. And this photo is probably taken in one of the national savings campaigns, um, because you can see the scouts behind them there. And later in the war, um, German and Italian POWs joined the uh, land girls working on local farms. I love this photo. What a great haystack. Yeah. <laughs> great, isn't it? So Jackson's Farm, I think, is where pretty much um, opposite where the Lynx Hotel is, which has now changed its name. Um, as you drive in on the A470, mm -hmm. it's yet another estate of houses, Jackson's Farm. And this is Pabo Hall. If you drive up the A470 from the Black Cat Roundabout at Clanton Junction, it's on your right-hand side. And this was requisitioned in 1944 as the um, Western Command headquarters for all the prisoners of war in North West Wales. Now, some of the prisoners were billeted in um, sort of Nissan huts in the grounds of Pabo Hall, but it was more of an administrative centre, and there were satellite camps housing the POWs across North Wales. There was one at Deganway at Bryn Estyn, there was one at Mine, and there was one at Tinnagroys, Clamroost, Pontnewid, Sarn, Fainall, Four Crosses, and Dolgetlight. And this is an aerial view of the one in Deganway, Bryn Estyn, of the Principality Nurseries. And this is the badminton centre that is still there today, yet again. Of course, it's all gone and it's all bungalows on it now. Yeah. And when the war had finished, um, a lot of the POWs remained locally. Um, in fact, the, you know, they were encouraged to stay. We needed them to, to work on the land. Um, and I was speaking to a he was a schoolboy at the time, he's now in his late 80s, and he was telling me that he lived on Bryn Mile Drive, which is just behind um, the, uh, the POW camp here, and uh, he used to play football um, against the Italians with, you know, um, jackets as goalposts. Well, they played football until the football burst, and of course in, in Russian hit Britain, it was very difficult then to get another football, so they didn't play football again, that was the end of that. Again in 1944, the Americans arrived. In total, three million GIs arrived in the UK. Um, so it's no surprise, really, that some came to Clandestine. And the most of these were medics. Now, I've already mentioned the accommodation problem. So we've got the School of Coast Artillery. We've got the Inland Revenue taking up all the accommodation. But now the Americans have arrived, and they need accommodation too. Um, and so the poor GIs were, were six to a room, I'm afraid. And I was talking to a lady the other day who um, was a child during the war. She remembers the Americans. And um, they were, her and her three sisters were put in the shed <laughs> to free up their bedrooms for the Americans. Because, of course, you know, it was a good, good little income, wasn't it? Um, and not only that, the GIs were very good at bringing gifts, yeah, you yes, know, whether it be nice. nylons or a bit of food or whatever, you know, so it was much better to have um, a house full of Americans, say, than um, the Inland Revenue staff from London, who <laughs> would rather sort of um, up themselves to a degree. And we've probably all heard the phrase first coined by Tommy Trinder, overpaid, oversexed and over here. Yes. But do you know what the Americans would reply? 
Yeah. You're underpaid, undersexed, and under Eisenhower. <laughs> <laughs> so, as I say, the Yanks were very popular in, in I don't know, I suspect uh, everywhere. And the kids would follow them around as well. Any gum chum? And, yeah. um, and the Americans, uh, they parked a lot of their vehicles up Queen's Road, which is um, going up towards what was the North Wales Medical Centre, now Blind Veterans UK. And apparently they must have had some, I don't know why for medics, but they must have had tracked uh, vehicles, because apparently uh, Clander Urban District Council <coughs> sent a huge bill to the US Army saying you've destroyed our road, basically. <laughs> you've completely churned it up with your tracked vehicles. Um, I have no idea what the outcome was um, of that. And with the Americans, their um, officers met was at the Drummond Hotel, uh, yeah, Drummond Villa, Drummond Hotel. That's where the National Trust had an office in Trinity Square for many years. Um, they've left now. Um, and much of the Americans' PT took place on the promenade, but also on the old uh, John Bright playing field that you can see here, and this which is now Parkland, I know, which was Asda. Uh, this was the original council football field, the Tins, as it was known. We've got John Bright here. And you can um, just make out the Nissan huts that the Americans had uh, for their mess kitchens. And then, again, as I said earlier, you know, you make use of things, don't you? So when the Americans left, uh, that became uh, the first Welsh school in Clandon, and then the Catering College, before the catering college got oh. absorbed into um, Clanrithlow College, or the yeah. tech, as I remember it, in, uh, in Rose. Oriel Mostyn, Mostyn Art Gallery. This, uh, the Americans used it as a donut dugout for their coffee and donuts. Um, and local ladies volunteered to, uh, to do the serving. And, um, the same lad who played football against the POWs was telling me that at the end of the day, um, his auntie apparently uh, volunteered, but at the end of the day they could take home any uh, donuts that, um, that weren't eaten. And so can you imagine for a small child in yeah, yes. war-torn um, ration hit Britain, that was, uh, that was some luxury. And this is another great photo of them. It was a donut. <laughs> the donuts. And actually, the, if you ever go in Oriel Mostyn in the shop bit, the counter is in exactly the same place, which is sort of quite ironic, and you can see through the, through the windows there. So moving on, the Home Guard. It's an object of fun, as we well know, in uh, companies such as Dad's Arm. But it was important for domestic security. Uh, it was Anthony Eaton, May 1940, who announced on the wireless of the formation of the local <coughs> volunteers. And this, of course, was when the risk of invasion from, uh, from Germany was at its highest. Um, so, local defence volunteers, LDV, look, duck, vanish, as some way to rename them. So, so Clandano uh, men, um, the first Clandano man, I should say, uh, who um, enlisted in the Home Guard was a chap called Jack Owen. And they were told to enrol at the police station. And he worked at Crossfield Buses, which in those days was on the other side of the road. So he was the very first. To, as soon as he heard it on the wireless, he ran across and he put his name down. Um, and this photo was taken on the evening of May the 31st, 1940. So this is just two weeks after the formation of the LDV. And this is the first parade. And as you can see, they're very well armed with sticks <laughs> and golf clubs, but they've got their gas masks. But they're keen. That's the main thing. And this uh, is, is later on in the war when things have been a, um, much more organised. And the chap in the middle there is uh, sort of the most uh, senior of the non-commissioned officers, um, Sergeant Major Tommy Owen. Tommy Sumner is who he's known, if any of you remember Sumner's. Sumner's yeah. Cafe, yeah. 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 He'd worked there since he was 15, so he was known as Tommy Sumner, but his real name was Tommy Owen. And he was awarded the MBE for his services to the Home Guard. <laughs> this photo is uh, one of the training exercises. This is in St. George's Place. You can see the back of the St. George's Hotel there. And we've got Sergeant Noel Thomas uh, with his Lewis gun. And his colleague here is uh, stopped a car and uh, checking for ID and uh, checking that a German spy is driving uh, through Flandern now. 
And this isn't a scene you see every day. Again, you've got the back of the St. George's here, and uh, you've got all the guys there with their, their various guns, the Lewis gun, got the Tommy guns. And look at him there. Yes. Yeah. 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 And you've got many of the civil servants, some of the girls at the back there, they're taking no notice either. <laughs> These couple of images were taken sort of in one of the same exercises, and as you can see, there's just a punch up, and this is basically outside where the library is, um, outside the Paragon restaurant. And um, the, the Nazis were regular soldiers who were dressed in black with um, swastikas painted in chalk on the back, and so the Home Guard had to, uh, had to detect them in Clandidno, and, and here they are, a bit of unarmed combat. Apparently one of the regular soldiers after the exercise was over forgot to take off oh. his, uh, his uh, outfit and wandered around <coughs> with a swastika on his back at the local kids saw shouting abuse at him and calling him Schuttlebruber. <laughs> so um, he, he never lived that down. And there are the, uh, the Home Guard had their own band as well, but they didn't have any instruments. But um, at the outbreak of the war, Conway Town Band um, Lost all his, basically lost all the members to the uh, to the armed services, so all their instruments were were doing nothing. So Clandon Home Guard uh, used Conway Town Band's instruments, and they headed many of the parades. <coughs> and our the Clandon uh, Home Guard also had uh, dispatch riders, and this is them going down Glorlight Street, which is the main that sort of big dual carriageway that links north to uh, to West Shore. You can see the old uh, the tram lines there. Um, the tram lines. Mm. And this, just draw your attention to this guy here. His name's John Holmes, and um, he um, was one of the dispatch riders. And he worked for Needham's Bakery. If any of you remember Needham's yeah. uh, before the war. And in 1943, he volunteered uh, to join the Royal Air Force. And there he is, there in his yes. uniform. And sadly, he was killed in January 1945. Uh, he was the engineer on a Halifax that came down um, while they were trying to drop supplies to Tito's partisans. Mm -hmm. And he came down in a, well, they all came down in a snowstorm. And uh, the locals buried them uh, at a local cemetery. And then uh, their bodies were exhumed and all taken to Belgrade. Um, and in fact, his son, uh, was also called John, was telling me that um, in the early 50s, the children of the Allied servicemen who had been killed in Yugoslavia were invited over and um, to, to see their father's graves, which mm. is, uh, and it was all paid for and everything. And he met Tito. Um, and what he was saying was that um, he had a, a house on an island, and um, to get to it, they obviously went by boat and he fell in. So it was a, a, he was only eight or nine years old. So he'd gone all the way to Yugoslavia to, on this trip and managed to, to, to fall in while, um, while uh, visiting the, uh, the leader. This is another Home Guard picture. We've got, um, you can just make out the old uh, chimney in the background, the old uh, electric works. This is around Cool Place. And there's a couple of lads here who want to uh, point out. Uh, John Gatley uh, is the one on the left there. And um, the Home Guard really was quite good training for these young guys before they were able to uh, enlist in the regular um, services. But unfortunately, both died during the war. John died of um, uh, pneumonia, and he's buried on the Great Orm. And Gwilym here, um, he was killed out in Burma. He was with the Dorsetshire Regiment, mm -hmm. um, and he died out there. So they'd done their sort of bit with the Home Guard, joined the regular army, and then they'd been killed. Son. And this is uh, found in a, a German um, archive of an aerial shot of Clandernau. And of course the Germans photographed every square inch of, of, of Europe. Yeah. Um, but this is the one of Clandernau, which uh, I found quite interesting. Clearly they... Um, well, there was, there was a worry, really, in, um, in Britain that the Germans might invade via Ireland, Operation Green, it was called. Um, Ireland air, of course, was neutral, uh, so to say, and, uh, you know, there was a real concern. And so they put huge defences along the west coast of Wales. If you go down to uh, Fairbourne 
or black rock sands, you can still see the dragon's teeth, these huge concrete blocks to stop yeah, tanks from yeah. approaching, barbed wire entanglements, minefields. Um, and the West Shore of Clandon, though, they obviously thought was a risk as well because they put quite a few pillboxes on it. Yeah. Um, and if you drive, I'm sure many of you have driven into Clandon though, from the Duganway side, and you've got Mice D Golf Club yes. um, here, yes. and yeah. actually on this side as well. But if you look closely at the walls, you've got loopholes, um, and these were put in in 1940 as, as part of the defence. Um, they're known as stepped embrasures, so that uh, you can see that. Uh, they, 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 they point out so that if you're behind them you've got a greater field of fire. Yeah. And there's also one you can just about make out at the uh, Gogarth Abbey Hotel that I mentioned earlier, the Alice Hotel. Um, and the, the toll house at West Shore, uh, the Home Guard also used the turrets of that um, as a defence system as well. That one was at uh, Penryn Bay. Um, it's I think it went in the 1950s when they completely redesigned the, uh, the sea defences there. Um, type 22 pillbox. Yeah. Only three bombs fell on Clandino during the Second World War on the evenings of the 30th, 31st of May 1941. <coughs> the chances are um, it was around the time that Liverpool and Merseyside was getting bombed and it must be uh, one of those that uh, decided pff, not taking these home. So they just dropped them anyway. Yeah. Um, I mean, the German bombers that went into Liverpool followed the North Wales coast. You probably know all this. You know, Ireland, as I said, was neutral. It wasn't blacked out. The bombers would take off from France, uh, from Brittany. They'd follow the Irish coast. Uh, they'd get as far as Dublin, turn right. You follow the Welsh coast, and it takes you straight into Liverpool. So um, it was probably on that night. And, and people tell me that you could see Merseyside on fire in the main blitz yeah, 1941 yeah. from. Yeah. Kind of no promenade, you could yeah. see the glow um, on the horizon. So this was one of the bomb uh, craters that fell, it, it's uh, on Nanta Gamma. Um, the other one fell close by and the other one fell uh, in the sea um, at Crady Don. And uh, they didn't cause any damage, but uh, of course it was a draw and magnet for local schoolboys who raced up there the following morning, yeah. a bit of shrapnel, which was a great currency in, in wartime Britain. Wars are very, very, very expensive, and to pay for it, the government needed the British people to uh, help through war savings, and every town and city across the land had a war saving centre, and uh, this was the one in Clandon. No, it was again in St George's Place, actually. It's now a chippy called St George's Place, and um, <laughs> though I always remember it as Horesh, if any of you uh, uh, know Clandon, no, it's where I always got my genes as a, as a teenager. Well, yeah, then, you're acting you today. Well, yeah, you're next door to my mum. Oh, I've always said Horesh. Thank you for pointing <coughs> 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 that out. Yeah. It'll be a charge. Sorry? It'll be a small charge. Oh, okay. <laughs> we can negotiate. Can we? <laughs> um, so from the uh, National Savings Centre, um, certificates, defence bonds, national savings stamps, that sort of thing were all sold. And there was a huge totaliser put outside. And as the uh, various National Savings Weeks went on, the totalizer would go up, a bit like Blue Peter. Do you remember the totalizers on that? Um, and in total, the people of Clandon raised three million eight hundred and twenty-five thousand pounds during the Second World War uh, in war savings, which equates to one hundred and ten million pounds in today's money, which is pretty impressive when you consider that Clandon only had a population of sixteen thousand, although it was swelled by those five thousand civil servants and the soldiers. And you have to remember as well that there wasn't exactly that much to spend your money on. The, pe the civil servants in Clandon were on London wages. Their board and lodgings weren't a huge cost in Clandon. Um, the only th there was nothing in the shops. I mean, there was entertainment, so there was a lot of theatres and cinemas and dances in those days. And that was pretty much all you had, really. So I suppose, you know, helping the war effort and investing is what you did. And every year they had a specific target uh, during one of the National Savings Weeks, and in November 1941 it was Warship Week, uh, as you can see there, target to raise £137,000 to buy a minesweeper called HMS Clandon. Um, and it was a huge success. Um, it was always a grand parade um, that started the week, 
I think. Yeah, you can just make out over there. This is the NatWest Bank and the Town Hall, and you can just make out Warship Week on the poster there. Town Bank leading the way. And HMS Clandernow was launched in 1941, but never visited the town. The Urban District Council were very keen to, uh, to, to bring it to Clandernow um, so that people could see it. And there was a, just quite a long history of Royal Naval ships coming into the bay throughout the 20s and 30s as sort of part of a PR, really, trying to sort of recruit. Um, and as I say, the, the council were keen to, uh, to get it there. HMS Clandernow's finest hour came 75 years ago this year um, on D-Day when she helped clear some of the, uh, the paths for, for the boats to, to land on the beaches of Normandy. Moving on, you're probably wondering what this one is, I wonder myself. Uh, the image on the left is a property called Place Grand it's on um, Glodyth Avenue. Um, and the reason I wanted to point it out was that it's got really quite um, ornate railings. Yeah. But in the modern picture, it hasn't. And the reason for that was that um, they were all taken for the salvage yeah. campaign. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which is such a shame because they weren't ever replaced. And you can see where, where, they, the, old they, ones where the old ones yeah. were. Yeah. And it was a Liverpool company that came along with their oxyacetylene you know, torches <laughs> and, and took them off. And uh, the ironic thing as well is that you know it all ended up in huge scrap piles at the end of the war because it actually wasn't a, a good enough grade. And the same went with the aluminium for the saucepans for Spitfires campaign. Yeah. It's galvanised, excuse the pun, the housewives of the country to sort of put their pots and pans in. But it was actually no good whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And in fact, um, there was um, a bell made uh, to raise money for the RAF Benevolent Fund during the war. And it was supposed to have been, so it says, cast from a wreckage of German planes that, you know, the, yes, the, yes. the, the Brill Cream boys had shot down. But of course it wasn't. It was made of your saucepans. <laughs> <laughs> so if you see them on eBay, they go for about 45, 50 quid. And it says on them, you know, well, these were made, they're not German aircraft at all. They're, they're great granny's saucepans. It's quite a sad story that this... Um, is a property called Tanner Bryn, which is now a nursing home, but it was a school, um, certainly in the First World War era. And the gates of it were taken for the salvage campaign, um, which is, you know, a sad irony because the gates were put there to uh, commemorate the boys from the school who had been killed. Um, and th this plaque was on the, uh, was on the gatepost. Um, but unfortunately, some builders have come along within the last couple of years, and that is now the plaque. Which it's very sad because that was a beautiful thing, and that isn't. And I found that in the skip. So, it is May the 8th today, which is... Yeah, yeah, yeah. which I then just sort of worked out because I put this photo on uh, Facebook earlier. So uh, yes, um, May the 8th, uh, 1945, VE Day, the end of the war in Europe, and this is a cracking picture uh, on the promenade, of, um, and most of these will be a mix of uh, civil servants and locals who were celebrating the uh, event. Um, the town band turned up and there was an impromptu parade, uh, there was dancing and parching, they uh, lit fires on the Great Orm and on the West Shore. Um, mm -hmm. VE Day was, uh, was celebrated much more than VJ Day. Um, uh, the Americans go in for VJ Day much mm -hmm. more than we do. We go uh, sort of VE Day a lot more. And in the weeks following the uh, end of the war, there were lots of street parties. This is Taliesin Street, which is the uh, little street opposite my museum. Um, and as you can see, they've, uh, I think you can make out somewhere in this photo that they've dragged the old Joanna out, dragged the old piano out for, for a bit of party. Uh, Bunting is, is across the road there. And uh, the Victory Queen was this uh, girl here, uh, Patricia Meredith, Pat Meredith. Um, and it must have been sort of mixture of sadness and joy, joy that the war was over, but sadness because her father had been killed, um, Francis Meredith. Uh, he was with the local um, 69th uh, Medium Royal Artillery, who were a kind of no territorial uh, battalion or battery uh, pre-Second World War, 
Um, and you've possibly heard of what happened at Wormhout in May 1940, when um, as the uh, Allies, well, as the British were retreating to Dunkirk, the local battery decided, the commanding officer decided to take a shortcut through the village of Wormhout, which had been held by the Germans. Um, and as soon as they drove in, they rambushed and opened up on them, and eight oh. Clandestine men were killed on the 28th of May, 1940. Now, her father, Francis, actually survived that, mm. made it back to Dunkirk. Um, they, a lot of them got out the back of their wagon and followed a stream uh, the 12 miles to Dunkirk and escaped the Germans that way. But yeah. others were rounded up, put in a barn, along with some guys from the Cheshire Regiment and the Warwickshire Regiment, and they were murdered, grenades thrown in, machine gun. Um, but as I say, he survived that, but he was killed in North Africa um, at the Battle of El Alamein. Um, he was killed by a Stuka dive bomb, actually. Um, I mention this story because my museum is, I mentioned it was a fire station during the war, but um, it was a garage after the war, and it was the Meredith family that owned it. So I sort of have this sort of um, yeah. connection with, um, with the Merediths. And there's a few more. This one's at Bridge Road. If you go over the Mindsteed Bridge, it's on the left-hand side as you go over. And we've got another one at Cum Place. I do like this photo, actually. I like these two here. Yeah. 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 Soldier. Imagine his mother, can't you, telling him to, uh, you know, to <laughs> stand up straight. <laughs> <laughs> the Cum Place is only uh, 20 houses, maybe, and, and four sons of... Uh, died from, from that little cold de sac alone, yeah. two brothers um, and two others. In fact, Willem Evans, the one I mentioned earlier uh, from Burma, uh, who, sorry, he was killed in Burma, uh, he, he lived in Cum Place. Um, and this is actually one of the only BJ Day uh, street parties um, photographs I've got. As I say, they wasn't uh, celebrated quite as heavily as, uh, as passionately as, as BE Day. This one's on Mowbray Road. Um, there was another huge bonfire lit at West Shore, and the, um, a lot of the guys from the School of Coast Artillery uh, sort of attended that, and they used their big searchlights to be for victory in the sky. And um, they, uh, they, the guys in the School of Coast Artillery uh, made an effigy of Tojo, the uh, Japanese Prime Minister, put that on top and burnt it. <laughs> so that was VJ Day. And then this photograph is, uh, is obviously of the War Memorial in Clandano. Yeah, yeah, yeah. uh, it took them until 1957 to add the 124 Clandano men who were killed in the Second World War to the 218 who were killed in the First World War. Yeah. Um, and this is a photo of the unveiling. And of course, sadly, since then, we've had another name added in 2003, Cruella Evans who died on the first day of the uh, Second Iraq War. Mm -hmm. So ladies and gentlemen, that's a very quick romp through Clan of Moon during the Second World War. Excellent. Any questions? Yes, one question. As you're going on the A55 up to uh, Anglesey, there's, on the left-hand side, there used to be, it's not there now, there used to be a clump of trees and it was a cross. Was it anything to do with the...? No, it, it's not a true cross. If you'd gone to and looked back, it, it was offset. It was something to do with the University of Bangor and their forestry, agri-forestry department. Oh, wow. And it was to do with shelter belts for sheep or something. But no, it, it's got nothing to it do was, with... Uh, well, it was told to us uh, on a trip going out yeah. to, uh, to um, Snowden, the kids from school, and they said it was... a. Uh, What's the meant for the planes to come back? No, after? no, no, it was... It was, uh, <laughs> no, it's, it was it's nice to know that, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I would only like to believe that, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've heard that said so many times, and so it must be yeah. sort of a folklore in North Wales, that one, yeah. but, um, but yeah. not true, I'm afraid. A myth. No I mean, myth. Mm. But it does look from. It did look like. No, yes, they've taken it away yeah, now altogether. Yeah. 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 But it did look very much like a cross. Yeah. Any others for any others? I can remember the child in Henry Fried writing what we call Spider Hop, Mount Pleasant, standing on the steps. 
watching the bombing of Liverpool right. mm -hmm. and seeing all the flames coming up and the bombers going over. And my cousin was also one of the young ladies who serves donuts to the Americans. Oh, was she? Yes. Yes. Um, and the other thing was that um, the little form, there used to be a gun sat there as well. That's right, yeah. Where I learned to drive down the road. <laughs> Yeah, the, the school of coast artillery on the Great Top, there was a practice camp on the Lake Lock, and, and that continued until after the war. Uh, it was 47, 48. And while the locals weren't, well, they were probably bothered during the war that they were firing these things at night, after the war, they asked the question, why? Why are you still firing these? The war's over. So, yeah. I, I, I learned on the old after car park. Yeah. I was going to see it was closed on Sunday. Thank you, Adrian. Pleasure. I hope you all enjoyed that. It's very interesting. <laughs> Wherever we originate from, we all have our memories of, uh, of things like this, and that was particularly interesting because uh, I, I think I know Slan did know reasonably well, or I thought I did until this evening, yeah. Um, yeah. and then you, uh, you come up with all that inf information. Mm -hmm. So it's very interesting. Thank you very much no, indeed. Pleasure. Thank you. Um, yeah. And I hope you'll stay for a, a cuppa. I'd love to. Thank you. Yeah. Um, well, are we ready with the raffle, Hayden? Oh, yeah. Yeah, Good man. Get the job the first ticket, do Yellow. Yellow six one six to six twenty. Six one six to six twenty. Huh? Okay. 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 Well, 